on this week's Cowboy Up podcast, meet Arnold, a true Western Renaissance man who feeds the world. Stephen, how are you doing this morning? I'm fantastic, Russell. How are you? I'm good. I, I was telling you last week, I, I was down at Kenyon Ranch slash, they now call it Two Back Ranch. That was a lot of fun. I'm still thinking about that. And and uh, we've got a pretty full house here at, at uh, White Stallion. Uh, you know, temperatures are in the low hundreds. In the low hundreds. Very <laughs> low hundreds. Hey, this ain't Phoenix. That's a first. No. <laughs> That's a first. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. Well, well we, you know, we get tagged with that 115, 20 stuff that they get in Phoenix. We don't get that stuff. Oh, no, never. It never feels that way. Oh, wait a minute. It does. It does. <laughs> no, it does. Go to Phoenix. So Arnold Burrell is here. We we had such a great time, uh, Alan and I and and Arnold, longtime farmer, um, land investor, variety of, uh, of di- very diverse crops and, and, and businesses and and uh, we talked a lot about that uh, we went it was so good we had to add a little extra bonus episode and we conned Arnold because he's busy to come back and and uh, here we are and and Arnold is is, is an incredibly busy guy he uh, told me what his schedule was the other day and how many miles he drives every single day. And uh, it would be kind of like following you around, but I think the two of you have a little bit in common anyway, don't you? Yeah, we were yeah. both born on the same day of the same year. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think we established, I was born 10.30 a.m. And I was 5.30 in the afternoon. Yeah, so, so I'm a little lazier I'm than you. A little, <laughs> little <laughs> older than yeah. you. Arnold. So one of you wanted out a so, little bit more. Exactly. So I have a little bit more gray hair and, and i don't really feel like right now i'm in a safe environment with the two of you yeah. here but, but we're gonna we're gonna give it a shot arnold it was genuinely wonderful to meet you a little bit i want to find out more about you because every time i talk to you you seem to have 10 different stories about 10 different things it reminds of somebody reminds me of someone who was born on the same day as you in the same year as you who also has stories that he shares and this is because the two of you have paid attention to what goes on how are you today I'm great. I want to thank you for having me back. I want to start this podcast by apologizing for missing the other day. We were going to to uh, do this at an earlier date, but uh, I found myself uh, in a little bit of a quandary. 27 truckloads of hay, made hay, baled hay, out in the field, and a huge monsoon coming. So we spent the whole day moving hay under the barns uh, because you'll take a heck of a quality loss and, of course, a financial loss. So, um, you know... Duty calls. Well, well so. and and you're a man of numbers. You understand. So what would that have cost you if if that had not been able to get that hay out of that field and under cover? What percentage lost would, would you have taken? Uh, the percentage lost, um, we probably need to put out a calculator, but a seven thousand dollar truckload would have become a forty five hundred dollar truckload. So about uh, about twenty five hundred dollars per truckload, and there was twenty seven of them. So a third almost. Yes. Times, yes. you know, well, times the 27. So you're talking <laughs> somewhere in the $70,000 worth of hit I would have taken that day. And it did rain a lot, as you know, yeah. that day. So uh, we were just under the wire. Thank God. Well, you know, one of the things I learned from Russell early on is he, is he told me, he says, well, the ranch is in charge. Mm-hmm. And I think in your case, it sounds like the farm is in charge. Yes. The tail wags the dog. Always. Yeah. I, you know, in, in, in our little dude ranch, our little true ranch collection saying, and I think Jay, my partner, came up with it or, or lives it, we live it, is the ranch is the boss. And, you know, the, to some people, I think particularly maybe people not my age, they would they would be offended on the emotional face of that. But if the ranch is the boss, everybody wins because... Employees uh, are truck. better off. Our man is much off. like yours. You take care of the farm, the farm will take care of you. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's absolutely accurate. So, mm-hmm. you know, Arnold, when we started talking, we were talking about so many different things. And what we've really landed on that I would like to talk about today is the fact that what you do for a living is what happens on 
every American's dinner table every single day. And without what you do, that dinner table really wouldn't be there, would it? Uh, that's correct. And not let's not talk about the American dinner tables. America feeds the world. Okay, uh, we fair. we export a huge amount of our production because, frankly, number one, we're not going to consume it. Um, but other countries are very agriculture deficit, uh, and they need that product. And as we know, the world's getting smaller. So there's no reason for a child to go hungry, to go to bed hungry at night. I said this, I think, at the last, last podcast. Uh, if a child goes to bed hungry tonight, it's a political problem, not an agricultural problem. For sure. Because the food is being produced. Yeah. Absolutely. And yeah. being distributed and everything and else. And the logistics is there. I mean, I, you know, you talk about a funny thought. I was watching Gladiator the other night. <laughs> and the things you might think of when you watch a movie like that. And I was saying to myself, back in Roman days, how did they bring the food in? Rome was huge. And we had horse-drawn carriages. How did you bring in all that food distributed to all those people on a daily basis? With, with what they had for technology then, you know, we take it for granted now. We have these super ships with containers. We have trucks going up and down the freeway all the time, the railroad. They didn't have any of that yet. Probably Rome was close to a million people and everybody ate every day. Well, you know, the, the podcast we did last week was by a gentleman named Timothy Weingarten who had just written a, a book about horses. And we learned some things about horses that I quite honestly didn't know. I mean, things like Henry Ford's initial plant where he was building the Model T was driven by horses. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was powered by power, horse manure. Ho powered by, by horse, horse manure. manure. Which I just thought, okay, wait a minute. Who would, who would have ever known that? And But that's what you're saying. Yes. Which, you know, is, you know... One of the most fascinating uh, uh, on the equine side uh, trips and pieces of knowledge you can pick up if you go down to the Copper Queen in Bisbee and do the mine tour. Yes. And they talk about lowering those those mules down into the shafts and giving them so much time to, to get over the, the night blindness, if you will. Those mules would not see the light of day again for years until they finally started to balk out or get a, you know get a little aged. And then they would give those mules to local ranchers or farmers once they came out of the hole. But once they came out of that mine shaft, they could never go back in. But that is what moved those ore trolleys up and down, was was red mules. Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. They, they were subterranean. They were fed down there. They had a veterinarian on, on, on call all the time down there. Um, they knew the value of those animals, and they made the thing go. Pretty amazing. Well, we, you know, Timothy Weingarten, our last, and, and he talked about World War II, two, two, not one, 85% of the German war effort was horsepowered as they entered the war, and when they left the war, it was 90% horsepowered. And I still find that just absolutely astonishing. But back to farming. Farming in America, you said basically we feed much of the world and it, couldn't be more true. The people that don't have food, they they have their own leadership and, and political upheaval or whatever's happening in their world uh, to blame, uh, which is tragic mm -hmm. in its own right. Innocent people victimized by political action, inaction. But how do you see American farming and, and say... A lot of our guests are European or from UK. How, how, how is farming seen differently by, by those parts of the world and ours? That's an absolutely great question. And um, as we alluded to earlier, uh, when you look at the agriculture uh, uh, atmosphere going on right now, um, obviously in Europe, they know what it's like to starve. They went through World War One and Two. Um, they know what it's like to be without, and they regard, they hold their, their growers, their farmers in high regard because they know what, what the foundation of the building looks like. And you need to be able to eat and have access to clean walk first thing and foremost every day. And then after that, we can get something done. But that, that is a, that, that is a, a non-negotiable situation right there. Uh, this country, for some reason, doesn't have the same regard for its agriculturists. Um, 
even though we are a small crosscut of this society, less than 1%, our industry enjoys the highest rate of suicide of all industries. Most people don't understand that, but when you think about some poor guy who's fifth generation farmer in middle America and he's losing the family farm, it's a pretty hard pill to swallow. And that's going on a lot. If you look at uh, commodity prices today, the one I'm familiar with, because as you know, this is a um, cotton growing area, um, today's uh, cotton price is about the same as it was in 1957. That's the only difference is, Yeah, the only difference is in 1957, I could buy a two row cotton picker for around $11,000. Today, you have no choice. There's only one cotton picker made in the world, and it costs $1.2 million to purchase that cotton picker, and you gotta pick a lot of 67 cent cotton to pay for a $1.2 million machine. And that's reflective of all parts, all, all parts of it. Uh, yet, uh, we do nothing, uh, for the, in my opinion, the base industry, the power of America, our strength, is not a bloated military. Sorry, that's how I feel about it, but I'm going to say it how I feel about it. That's not what makes America great. What makes America great is middle America, the breadbasket. What makes America great is that we could shut our borders and we could feed our people without anybody's help. There's not too many countries in the whole world that can make that statement. No. Not at all. And if we get this oil industry going, we could do it with our own fuel as well. So um, autonomy is the ultimate strength, and we're one of the few that could achieve it, maybe the only. Well, I, I just read a book, and it, it, just increasingly upsetting to me, I can't think of the name, but it, it talked about uh, essentially deglobalization, and it said that the United States was uniquely and this was coming from a, a very broad perspective. You, you, the U.S. was uniquely prepared and positioned to survive deglobalization. And uh, the whole theme of the book was talking about what it's going to look like if America uh, separates from its job post-World War II as the world's policeman. And it talked about the United States will be pretty okay. Yeah. Because but the rest of, of the world won't. And energy, now, without like our said. help, yes. You know, um, a few years back, I remember the the panic amongst Americans that uh, for a moment we weren't the world's largest GNP. China mm -hmm. beat us out for a few months there, and I was thinking to myself, everybody was was, was it, all my friends were coming to me and saying, "What do you think, Arl? What do you think?" Well, I told them it's a long ways from catching up to us. It took 1.2 billion people to equal what 330 million Americans can do. Look at that. We are the producers of the world. We're the workers, and we need to stay being the workers. And when I see the attitude that today's American is, is, is developing, I wonder what our future looks like. So I wouldn't have thought to ask you this question, but this book also talks about um, the obvious and... and uh, just well positioned potential partnership with the United States and Mexico, and you have some knowledge of Mexico. Yes. And and in in the future is that is that a realistic partnership? I would like to think it is. Obviously, I'm I'm Hispanic, um, and uh, you know have a lot of heartstrings still down there. Uh, they have a lot of problems, <laughs> but they are without a doubt a natural to be a, a partner with the United States. Uh, I'd like to see us both figure out our problems. Uh, the southern border, as we know, is a mess. Um, but as, as far as two countries go, what we have to offer each other, I think, I think it could be such a symbiotic relationship if we would get to it. Yeah, it, it, it should be a symbiotic relationship. It's not one feeds the other, we can feed each other. Exactly. Exactly. And, 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 you know, this, this is what you've said, and you've, you've actually said it in one way or another just about every time we've talked. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's so wise of you. I mean, I listen to Russell, and he tells me, well, I'm just a simple dude rancher. And I listen to you, well, I'm just a farmer. But it just there's so much more. You can't just be a farmer and be successful. It's not how it works. 
No. You can't no. just grow some crops. There's so many other things that go along with it. Talk about that for just a minute because, you know, you, like you said, you had those 27 truckloads of hay. Mm -hmm. Somebody had to buy, buy that hay. So, so somebody had to be able to communicate with you. And then you had to have a truck to put it on. That truck had to know to go there. Exactly. Uh, you, you start out by uh, renting or buying a piece of ground. So then you got to become a soil scientist, hmm. which leads right into being a hydrologist. You know, what's the infiltration rate of my soil? What's the water holding capacity? What crops am I going to grow there? What's going to be the nutrient needs of those crops? What are going to be the pests that attack that crop? Am I going to have to spray them? Am I going to have to spray them aerially? Or am I going to be able to control them with a GMO or something of that nature? Uh, you know, weeds. So you've got to learn something about herbicides, pesticides. Um, then you've got to be an economist. Then you've got to be a marketer. In my case, like you said, yeah. we move about 1,600 truckloads of hay a year. So 1,600 truckloads, truckloads of hay, hay a year. year? Yes. That is remarkable. That's it. And that's, you know, you talk about the tail wagging the dog. When I started uh, school, I couldn't speak English. Now it seems like that's all I do all day long is talk to people and, hey, you know, could you use another truckload of hay? Where are we going? Tell me what your future plans are and we'll be ready for you. I mean, it's it's an amazing, amazing thing that we all can say this, especially at at, a, at the age we're at now. We never saw ourselves doing this. We never saw our our lives becoming this complicated and full and complete. And I'm having the time of my life. Well, for me to be sitting here with the two of you um, five years ago, I would not have predicted anything like this could happen. And I got to tell you, it's pretty cool. Oh, I love what you guys do. I, I love watching, uh, listening to it. That's what I do is, as I do my 250 miles a day, a day. I uh, I <laughs> listen to the podcast. Yes, well, I love thank it. you. Do you seriously? Yes. That, that's fantastic. But but again, you, you talked about what it is you do. I look at what Russell does, and Russell, like you said, he's telling me he's just a simple dude rancher. I watch what he does with horses, with guests, with food, mm -hmm. with hospitality, with the land that he has here. And he still has a family. He's got a young daughter and a wife. And he just, he seems to manage it all. And I can't, I'm going to think to do it. You don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> we sleep well. Well, uh, you know, in, in my case, I don't sleep because I'm always worried <laughs> about that last truckload that isn't under the bar. <laughs> uh, and, you know, this morning is a good example. Uh, I woke up. Um, obviously things change to check the weather channel. That's the first thing I do every morning, check the weather channel. And oh my gosh, where did all this rain come from? So the guys are bailing here in Marana. Uh, I call the guys. I have another farm up in Eloy and that crew is getting ready to bail. Uh, what we have here is some rained on damaged hay, not much. And I mean, I, we totally changed the program this morning after I saw the weather channel and all hands on deck, everybody headed to Eloy and that stuff is pristine premier hay freshly cut and we're getting that bailed up and under the barn and the stuff that already got rained on probably going to get rained on again but we had to, we had to change our plan at the drop of a hat and and get up to Eloy and take care of the quality hay incredible so look your 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 farming business among other things that you do is move toward alfalfa yes and you know as a buyer of alfalfa i know very well that it's a it's a pretty widely fluctuating commodity so that's got its own challenges but you moved away from cotton yes. i think you even have a name for cotton the poverty weed <laughs> yes and yes. and you know 67 cents a pound same yes. same price it, it, as it, it, cotton, 70 it, years ago yes cotton is is um, the greatest girlfriend in the world if she's not lying to you about how much how much she's going to be worth, the value of it, then she's lying to you about how much she's going to yield. <laughs> um, <laughs> I just got I just got sick of it, man. Mm -hmm. I just you know you'd walk up to a to a field of cotton, you'd just be in love with it. And finally, finally, okay, I get to make money this year. Well, no, sorry, uh, we don't look this good in the middle of the field, and so the yield just wasn't there. And I I just got sick of it. It just never never. Never uh, failed to disappoint. And <laughs> never failed to. So, Pima County, Pima Cotton. This this was big cotton area. When I grew up, there was cotton everywhere. Yes. There was. I think I could drive within ten minutes, maybe fifteen to three gins. Mm -hmm. Is there an operating gin 
Where's the nearest operating gin? The nearest operating gin is in Eloy now. Yeah, so that'll right. that'll be you know thirty five miles away. Uh, Super gins. I'll tell you this story. You're gonna like this. One. Hmm. So um, because I am, even if when it comes to the poverty weed, I'm a farmer at heart at the MI core. Um, I'm in big five sports. Remember they, before they closed down, uh, and I was picking up some golf stuff. I love to golf when I can get away. And I turned around, and I was walking out of the store with my stuff, going up to, to, to the cashier to pay out. Had a couple of golf clubs in my hands, whatever, and I looked up on the wall, and I dropped everything I had. Well, it wasn't seriously full of the store there, so you could hear it all over the store. The golf club was clanging on the ground and stuff. And a lady walked up, and she said, sir, is there a problem? I said, yeah, there's a huge problem. There was an Under Armour ad across the face of the store in huge, huge letters, the whole store, and it said, cotton is the enemy. Cotton is the enemy. So they were selling this. Remember when they came out? Oh, sure. First came out with the wicking products sure. and everything else. And she says, "What's the problem?" I said, "Well, I said I don't know where you get the oil for your polyester, but I will tell you this: that the cotton farmers are your neighbors, they're your friends, and you're waging war on your own people." And I, I told her, "I can't buy here. I'm not even going to put this stuff back where I picked it up. <laughs> I'm just going to walk out." And uh, believe it or not, we started a grassroots effort, me and that young lady. And within an hour, we were talking to uh, uh, CEOs of Big Five Sports. And they called Under Armour and said, we're going to have to drop this ad. And Under Armour said, we never looked at it that way. We're dropping the ad. Nice. Well, that's a good story. But if you don't take care of yourself, who's going to take care of you? Remarkable. Wow, that's a good story. You're right. That is a great story. Yeah. And on that... We're going to take a break. We've gone way over. Well, thank you, Arnold, Stephen, and Russell. Once again, we learn more here by accident than most places by design and uh, another inspiring uh, conversation. My name is Stan. I'm uh, the radio man, and I'm the leader of the uh, Cowboy Spirit Radio Network. And we are the ones who uh, have the privilege and the pleasure of distributing and bringing this Cowboy Up podcast going on the fifth season now. And when uh, Russell and Alan and the others uh, first began, they thought, well, we'll give this a try. But, you know, it probably won't work out. But, of course, we all know it worked out great. And so I'm going to encourage you. uh, Perhaps you've always thought, maybe I'd like to be on the radio, but there's no way I could ever do that. Well, Times have changed, things have changed, and you can be. And what we are doing at uh, What It Takes Radio and the Cowboy Spirit Radio Network, we are looking for people like you who have talent, you have wisdom, you have insight, you have some truth, and you have wonderful stories to tell about perhaps growing up in the Western way and uh, right now living it out. And perhaps you've written something, you sing something, you do something that can bring a a smile to the face of many people and obviously maybe even touch their heart with your story and uh, maybe even stir their mind to new ideas. That could be you. So I would encourage you to uh, go to uh, witradio.net and check that out. And then write to me at stan at witradio.net. That's stan, S-T-A-N, at witradio.net. And say, Stan, uh, I'm interested in maybe doing something just like Russell does. And so uh, could we have a conversation about uh, being on the radio? Well, speaking of the radio program, let's get back right to it now. You know, water, since I've lived in Arizona, I've only lived in Arizona something less than four years, I hear from everybody that there's no water left. I've got people in California saying, you better move back because it's actually rained in California now. So they have, you know, three glasses of water that they can spare. And there's no water left in Arizona, and I better get out while I still can. What's your point of view on that? I think they're right to the, for the most part. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the dependence on the CAP, on the Colorado River, yeah. we, we have learned that uh, that is not um, 
uh, what would you say, like a static situation. There's a lot of fluctuation. Sure. And at any time, that thing can, and like it did right now, we're in the middle of a drought and the, the lake levels are very low and agriculture, as you know, got cut off from CAP water. Uh, doing everything we can to keep the municipalities alive, if you will, but there's changes being made as far as like how much water you can use for yards and things of that nature. We have a limited resource here, and it has a limited replenishment. Um, we live in an area right here where we have an unbelievably strong aquifer. There's plenty of water underneath us. I think this area could stand a little growth. Uh, with the replenishment that we're getting. But you look at a, a large municipality like the Phoenix Valley, they're tapped out. They're tapped out, and they need new water resources if they're going to grow. So um, I think the number I heard the other day is um, Department of Water Resources has issued 100-year assured water certificates, which you have to have, to build a home for 180,000 unbuilt homes that they don't have any water for. They, they finally did their accounting and did their uh, uh, hydrological study of their aquifers up there, and they realized that they're tapped out. They're, they're, they're actually bouncing checks. 180,000 homes that are not yet built. They've got certificates issued. That's right. That's and, interesting. And uh, most people don't know, Pinal County, there's a moratorium on development. There, you cannot build um, single-family dwellings in anything that doesn't have a pre-existing 100-year assured water certificate, and there are no new certificates being handed out in Pinal County. And any sense of, because um, Pinal's kind of a pro-growth place, so that's a powerful statement when you say that. You know, that they're very industry friendly, and we're finding right now that as, as that industry grows and their demand for employees grows, um, the bedroom communities on either side of that uh, county Marana right. and 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 uh, you know Chandler Gilbert area uh, Maricopa uh, are flourishing because they're definitely selling homes, but those people are commuting to work. No kidding. So no. for people who aren't from Arizona, uh, Maricopa County is a, a large county, including Phoenix and Pinal is a sort of a long narrow county between Pima, which is Tucson, mm -hmm. and Maricopa, which is Phoenix. The I think the probably the biggest town in Pinal is. Casa Grande? Casa Grande. Perhaps. And a uh, huge. I, I don't know if Maricopa in, is in, in, in Pinal County. It might be. So. I would think so. Yeah. I'm not sure. But a lot of development, uh, industrial uh, and development up there. So um, what? So what is, how does that impact ag? Well, yeah, I'll tell you how it impacts ag. Um, people need water. And, you know, if, you, if, if you're either farming or growing houses. That's just how that goes. It, it, we don't mix it too very much. Uh, and of course, in the state of Arizona, which this really surprises me, uh, you take, you know, we were talking about California earlier, uh, Colorado being another more liberal state than, than Arizona. In both those states, farmers are making good money leasing or selling their water to people in need, municipalities, sure. whatever. In Arizona, the water's been legislated away from us, from agriculture. So the state of Arizona basically owns that water. And what they're doing now is they're incrementally taking the water away from agriculture and handing it to development and with no compensation to the farmer. So, A, California does not have the socialized water that, that, that Arizona that has. That Arizona has, okay. correct. Okay. Interesting. It's very interesting, isn't it? Yeah. And Colorado, which is another one that was very interesting. Yeah. No, no socialized. No water. socialized water. And, and then in Arizona, even though an ag property would have applied for and received grandfather rights mm -hmm. for ag water rights, mm -hmm. jurisdictions are legislating that away from that ag property and handing it to residential what i was told and believe me as you know i've been in the middle of the water oh, wars yeah, for absolutely. years um what i was told basically is how arizona feels about it is your grandfather water rights certificate which you know our forefathers developed after world war ii they put in these big wells and these huge farms 
uh, the 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 uh, America needed something for the returning soldiers to do, so he paved the road for them to be farmers and ranchers and stuff. Anyway, bottom line is, the, your grandfather water rights certificate, it means nothing more than you have the right to harvest the public's water for agriculture use, hmm. which is a long ways from what it was in 1980 when the ground, uh, 1980 Groundwater Act was enacted. And, and even in the 1980 Groundwater Act, we had great equity in this water. But over time, it's been twisted and turned and squeezed, and it is what we have today which is a taking, a legitimate taking, government taking of a, of an equity, of a, of a right, and uh, without compensation. And boy, I tell you what, you can't get anybody to touch this hot potato for anything. We've gone to uh, the Goldwater Institute. Yeah, they'd be the they, you obvious think we, we, we want and, and I mean, they'll take on anything. Nope, they will not touch this. Really? Nope. And, and as you said, in the first half of our podcast today, uh, people have to have food, abundant food, and they have to have clean water. Yes. And with the government controlling the clean water, how much else do they control? At, you know, it, with the atmosphere and farming and, and the way things are declining, um, number one, it, I would not recommend it to young people, okay, today, which means that I think we're headed for institutionalized farming. I think that's what our government wants. Will the government be better at raising crops on a per acre basis, yield, whatever, than an individual who cares and loves for that land? I doubt it very much. Well, uh, we'll see where's, a decline. Where's some, where is history's example to, mm-hmm. to show that that would be a good idea? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and I watch how Russell takes care of White Stallion here. Yes. And he only has the 3,000 mm-hmm. acres, which most people can't comprehend. He is, between him and Michael, they're absolutely going to take better care of this land than anyone from the government. They love it here. This is the only place they've ever these lived. Two, these two guys never rest. No, they don't. They never rest. No. I mean, I, I watch them go. You know, I come <laughs> over on a regular basis. We come over for the Wednesday rodeo. These guys don't have a moment to take a deep breath. No. It just amazes me. I'm, I kind of makes me feel good about being a farmer sometimes. <laughs> well, I, 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 I watch the two of them, and... I know Russell sometimes out of bed at 5.30, and he's mm-hmm. not in bed at 11 o'clock at night, and he doesn't quit moving. Trying to follow him around is almost impossible. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it, it's it, and I'm not saying this as, as hyperbole. It's, it's, it's a fact, and I know enough people in Tucson that say, how do you keep up with this man? I said, well, you really don't. No. You just, you've got to pick your shot. It's because you know, I'm confused and, and, and disorganized. And, and the <laughs> thing is, uh, I such a, a, a parallel between them. I know that there's not a job on the farm that I won't do. No. So I, I, I and there's not a job on the farm that I haven't done. So when I send a man to do it, uh, they don't realize sometimes. Hey, listen, I'm sending you to do that because you get to sit in an air conditioned tractor. Because if you had to do what I'm going to go do, <laughs> you'd quit me, and I can't afford that. <laughs> well, it is. It, it's kind of like my kids sometimes forget that I was 19 once. Yeah. And I did those stupid things that you do at 19. They just don't think I understand. Yeah, but that's different. When you're 19, you're supposed to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> that, that's it. You know, even though it's been done a million, billion times. Yeah. Yeah, you think you're the first guy to do this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was in no danger of reinventing the wheel. I promise. <laughs> then or now. Okay. But, you know, I, like I said, I, I, I watch what you do with the amount of responsibility. I mean, how many acres do you do you act, actively farm right now? And how many farms do you have? You know, right now we're at we're at 5,000 acres. Um, let me see here. Farms, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different locations. Seven different locations. And that's where you drive to every day. Every day. When I, when I start, I'll drive south, check the south farms first out in Avra Valley. By the time I make my circle, it's 78 miles just to get to, to the Eloy farm. And I make my circle. I get to the Eloy farm, and then the 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 horror starts. The phone starts ringing. Mm-hmm. I need this part, and this is broke down. That so then I'll end up in Casa Grande and Coolidge getting parts. Those are the two major part houses, okay. and then back down here and start gluing it on stuff. And that's what we do. And you know, day. and I, and I won't belabor it because we talked more about it last time you were here. And and but you know, some people have seven farms. Because they started with 14 farms and they they lost seven. You started with nothing. True. True. And and um, you know I 
my epitaph will be, um, if I'm lucky, he didn't screw up a great opportunity. Um, you know, I had this amazing opportunity to to uh, take White Stein to a little better place because we started at a better place than our parents did. But you started from nothing. You, your father did a lot of stuff. He worked with the Arizona Feeds and did, did a lot, but, you know, you're the American story. And no, we're, we're the American dream. My family is the American dream. And we, we didn't start with nothing. We started with a lot. We started with a man that led by example, wasn't afraid of anything. And, uh, you know, when we started the farm, I remember his quote was, well, we really can't lose much because we didn't have much to begin with, <laughs> you know. And uh, he set a perfect example. He taught us how to work. He taught us about responsibility. Um, and you just didn't shirk it. You, you, you lived it every day. I had no idea that you could open Christmas gifts in the morning. We got up and fed 9,000 hogs on Christmas morning. 9,000? 9, 9,000 hogs. We had a complete feral to finish operation all under roof. But we had to go make sure that those hogs were fed and the, all the waters were were uh, were working correctly. And if there was any dead, pull them out of the pen, the whole nine yards. It was, it was production agriculture. We did that first thing on on Christmas morning my whole life. That's just what you did. Thanksgiving, whatever. Valentine's Day, I don't care what day it was. You, the, the hogs ate first, then we ate. <laughs> yeah. we, we, did, we were the opposite. We we had to get up early and have Christmas quickly, which is never bad when you're a kid anyway, right? Yeah. So it was, it was certainly no no tragedy. But because our parents had to be at work as soon as the guests got out of their beds yes. and were hitting the dining room. And so we hit Christmas early, then moved on with our lives. And uh, that's just how it goes. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to end with this. Uh, no one has a crystal ball and, and things are moving in so many unpredictable ways. I mean, you just look at our political situation over the last few weeks. I mean, it's just dizzying. But best you can predict, what does Arizona agriculture look like in 10 years? About like it looks now, declining. At to, to what level by then? Who knows? Uh, even existent is a good question. I see, I see ranching. Holding on quite well. Uh, I see irrigated agriculture being hard to hold on to. Uh, that water's, you know, too valuable to, to sit out and, if you will, grow low brow crops compared to four homes per acre and all the economy that comes with it. Um, I, I, this, we're being squeezed out and, and it's happening. The, the Marana area is a great example. I mean, I think Pinal, I mean, Pima County was down to about 14,000 irrigated acres, and we were static there for the longest time. No. And I bet you we've lost three to 4,000 of those acreages in the last couple of years. You're kidding. Nope. In and, Pima and, County, and, one of the biggest counties physically in yeah. the United States, yes. in a place with the egg history. Yes. I mean, and, some and, people say Tucson was the first uh, organized agriculture in, in the world. At the base of a mountain. A mountain, yes, yes, and and, 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 and you're you're saying fourteen thousand, and it's down. Yes, yes, and and we're 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 plummeting. Um, very little land in the in the Marana area is held any longer by farm families or farmers. Sure, most of it's all investor owned now, and it's just you know leasing back, leasing it back, for... holding the taxes until it's that ground's turned to develop. Uh, yeah, it's basically gone. The largely, the biggest farm, probably the biggest single chunk of, of land is the LDS Church Farm over on the northwest side of the Marana Valley. Have you been out there lately? Mm, no. It's covered in solar panels, like 1,400 acres of them. Wow. Yeah, so you just take that 1,400 acres right out of the Cortero Water System, Water District. Wow. Because that, that, that has just happened. And I mean... They only started a couple of months ago. You ought to go out there and have a look at what's going on. And we're seeing a lot of that. And we're seeing a lot of that. As you know, our large farm in, in Eloy is under contract to become a solar farm as well. And um, it's a great use for it. I mean, there's a lot of land out there that doesn't have enough water for development. But it can produce a lot of cheap, free energy, you know, after the initial investment. 
I don't mind that use for it. At least we're farming something off that land, getting something out of it. And uh, and uh, I guess, you know, if you believe in green energy, also we're doing it with green energy. So Nice. Nice. Yes. I, I have one final question if we have just a minute. I know that you are part of your, part, one of your roots is as a cowboy. Yep. And you still compete. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that briefly? Because I know over Fourth of July you were actually in a competition. Yes, yes, I went. Uh, I went team roping. I don't. I don't calf rope anymore. Don't know if I'm ever going to again. A few shoulder and knee surgeries later. Um, I don't feel the the drive I used to at one time. <laughs> Although I'll tell you, once I get around it and those young kids start running down the rope and blanking and tying, you know, I I, I gotta admit, I I'll I'll pick up a string and, and join them for a little bit. <laughs> but uh, yeah, competed. Uh, uh, and lately I've won, uh, I won both evenings. There was a new rodeo each day at, uh, at Silver City. Uh, won the team rope in there, healing. Um, and then, uh, won fourth in Springerville. Uh, had a really good chance to make money at Linden Valley and just drew a bad steer for our last steer, uh, at a large jackpot. There was 510 teams in that jackpot. Paid like a slot machine. Yeah, man, my engine revs up when I, when I get in the, and, and you were one of the younger competitors, as I understand it, right? Yeah, <laughs> ab ab absolutely. The Methuselah of the group, but uh, yeah, I will tell you this. Uh, one of my, uh, one of my, he's a good friend. He's a he's a crack up. He's a young kid, but a really good kid. He he loves to rope too, and he, we are we're, we're always teasing each other. There's a lot of manner, and uh, he asked me. He says, "Oh man, you know, how long are you gonna do this?" He says, that gut's kind of getting out there. Is it going to get in your way here sooner than later? Ooh. And oh, he was after me, and I looked at him, and I said, man, I sure wish you wrote better. I wouldn't eat so good. <laughs> I like it. Yes. I like it. Hey, he poked the bear. All I did was snap back. There you go. There you go. And I'm sitting with somebody else who snaps back from time to time. Yes. I truly appreciate that. Yes. But, but, you know, you had asked that question, and it feels great at this age. To still be relevant, to still be able to, you know, get in there, mix it up with the boys, and take some of their money. It doesn't feel bad at all. Uh, I feel blessed at this age to still be competitive. Well, I don't think we're going to see you in a hospital room anytime soon. Let's hope not. Arnold, I truly appreciate you coming in, into the studio today to so spend some time with us and share some of your stories. Oh, it's always a hoot. You guys keep this thing going because you guys fill up my day with good entertainment while I'm making my laps. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much, Arnold. You bet. Yes, indeed, Arnold. Keep a pressing on. Uh, we are looking forward to more stories from you. And uh, thank you very much for being a part. Hey, this has been a pretty good time. 40 minutes, learning something new, a little entertainment, uh, a smile. Aren't you glad that you are a regular part of the Cowboy Up podcast? Well, we'd love to hear from you, so uh, please let us know what we can do to help you, how we can improve. And again, maybe you have some suggestions for this program, so reach out to us at the Cowboy Up podcast at gmail.com. The Cowboy Up podcast at gmail.com. And remember, we are at the White Stallion Ranch in uh, Tucson, Arizona. And so uh, if you want to uh, have the beginning or maybe the ongoing cowboy experience, why don't you contact the people right here with Russell and all of his fine uh, cowboys and cowgirls and wranglers and uh, good folks. And uh, they'll find a place for you here or at one of the many other ranches in the True Ranch Connection. So go to whitestallion.com, whitestallion.com, and uh, look them up, see the story, and uh, then give them a call. And maybe you'll be here and actually be a, a part of the radio program sometime. My name is Stan Houston. It's my privilege and pleasure to uh, bring this to you. And we thank you for your time and your attention Thank you for recommending us to others and all the best and blessings to you and your family and your business that you do so well. Bye for now.